Evidence Experiments from Nature Introduction Displacements Knowledge and wisdom begin at the sickbed, Centaurus had said. A small crack in the body's frame will shake the soul's backbone, a trumpet blaring what we stand to lose. A man was sitting at Galileo's bedside, tall and dressed in a maroon jacket. His long eyebrows stood out straight as he spoke. Then he introduced himself. His name was Frick and began telling Galileo what was to come. He would read books of many kinds, encounter people of many ages, and there was much for him to study about the world, about man and about the soul. Along the way he would learn a story filled with revelations, more plentiful and astonishing than the Bible. Unlike the Bible, this story did not fancy a special place for us, not for our world, not for our race, and not for our soul. It was a story that promised no retribution, good or bad, a story for grown men, not a consoling tale for children or so Frick said. The first great revelation was one for which Galileo had been the prophet. It was about the Earth's place in the universe. Galileo and his telescope had been right. The Earth is a small planet orbiting around a common star. Powerful lenses had revealed more, and worse, that our star is one out of billions within our galaxy, that our galaxy itself is a modest one, one out of billions of other galaxies, and that all of them were born to be cast off in a giant universe. Perhaps one of many, one that had been growing for billions of years, and after billions more would die. Even the prophet should feel dizzy at the immense magnitude of the Earth's insignificance, Frick had said. There are innumerable suns, and an infinite number of Earths revolve around those suns, Bruno had claimed before burning at the stake. Perhaps he had been prescient in his madness, thought Galileo. Though man had risen high and landed on other planets, he had no hope of ever to visit the center of his universe, if there was one, Frick had said. The prophet was but a forlorn curate in a remote village of a great empire, one who would never, not in a million lives, travel as far as Rome, if indeed there was a Rome, or even glimpse at the great capital from remote distance and news, if it ever made it to his obscure corner, would be thousands of years old when it would reach him. Science had grown and prospered, though whether it was all for the best remained to be seen, Frick also had said. Man had mastered many of the laws that govern nature. Some Galileo had surmised, others he could not begin to imagine. Science had given us great power, Power to move fast, to generate vast amount of heat, to create new crystals and new metals, and to send words and images over the earth in little time. But there was no escaping what these discoveries told us, that we are confined forever in a faraway province of the universe, and to that universe our lives are rounded with an instant, drowned inside a point. Galileo shivered as he thought of himself watching the night sky on his terrace, young and eager, and did not know whether he felt proud or humbled. The second revelation dealt with the place of the human race. That place too was in no way special, Frick had said, for we had learned that man descends through a long lineage of species from the simplest forms of life, to small and primitive, that the first ones came together spontaneously out of molecules of the earth. And over millions of years, most of the species that had touched the face of the earth had died off, never to return. Others survived for a while by changing and adapting to the harsh ways of the world. Closest to us among the survivors were the hairy brothers living among the trees, but even snails and flies were not too distant relatives. Perhaps a poet had said it long ago, thought Galileo. The earth created many monsters then, which came out with extraordinary faces and bodies. Creatures with no hands or feet, mutes without mouths, 
Blind beings with nothing to look with, and some with arms and legs stuck to their bodies so, that nothing could they do nor go anywhere. But all is to be right for species to last and reproduce, and many have died out. Wherever you see a creature that survived, it was craft or strength or speed that saved it. The body of man was not the masterpiece of an all-seeing engineer, but had developed by blind trial and error over millions of cruel and wasteful years. The instructions to build that body, revised many times by change and fate, were stored in simple molecules, threaded together in long, twisted strands. Atoms make up molecules, molecules make up cells, and cells make up the skin, the muscles, the heart, and yes, the brain. Nothing but atoms and the void. As the poet had said, thought Galileo again, All nature then, as self-sustained, Consists of twain of things, Of bodies and of void, In which they're set, And where they're moved around. Billions of atoms, Arranged into molecules, Arranged into cells, Make up our whole body, And that of every other man, and that of every other animal or plant. There is no magic anywhere, all is mechanical. This knowledge too has given man great power, power against disease and death, Frick had said. But there was nothing special about man, his body or his brain. If one wanted scores of newborn Galileos, each young, each strong, each feeling a private surge of ambition, a goal set in his fierce mind, ready to fight each other in battles of equal intellects, could be generated out of a shred of his old man's skin. The instructions that mattered were all there. You are merely another beast in the great zoo of the universe, Frick had said. And finally, there was the third revelation. The most daunting of all, the one that dealt with the place of the human soul. The revelation was this, that you, your joys and your sorrows, your memories and your ambitions, your sense of identity and free will, are no more than the behavior of billions of nerve cells in your brain, and of the molecules that make them up. You are nothing but a pack of neurons, nothing but a pack of molecules, Frick had said. This Frick had said, perhaps with a tinge of satisfaction, thought Galileo. And Frick had twisted the knife into the wound. You are proud of your strong intellect, so strong it challenged the stars, but all there is to it are well-endowed nerve cells somewhere in your brain, just like all there is to a brute are bulkier cells in his muscles. You pride yourself that you are a pious, compassionate man. Instead it is just this. By chance, within your brain, some cells are less loosely knit than those of wanton criminals. You are sure your will is powerful, your choices are guided by your conscience. Instead you are a mere servant of hoarders of nerve cells, you follow their instructions to the letter Frick had said. You are empty, Galileo, and have no spirit. Nothing enters your immature body at conception, and nothing leaves your carcass at death. You are but a slave changed to a dying machine, over it you have no power, and its end will be your end. It will be the end of an illusion. Frick's long eyebrows were peering at him, as if to check whether he had made an impression. That the earth stood still at the center of the universe was indeed an illusion, thought Galileo. Perhaps it was an illusion too that plants and animals and the human race had been created and were immutable and perfect. After all, even the poet long ago had said that they evolved by chance and survival. But the soul... How can the soul be an illusion? How can consciousness be just a mechanical play of atoms and molecules? Because I may be mistaken about what I see, or feel, or think, or wish, but that I see, feel, think, or wish, I cannot be mistaken. I thought I was in the monastery of my youth, and I was mistaken. I was having a dream. I may be having a dream now and be mistaken again. The world, myself, all life, all history and all science may well be images and thoughts happening in a dream. But the dream itself is real. My consciousness, 
whether I am dreaming or awake is real. If consciousness is an illusion, then only illusion is real, and the rest is conjecture. There is no explaining consciousness by atoms and the void. Or is there? Sanctorius and Frick, both of them, whether imaginary or real, in dream or in reality, had told him the same thing. Somehow our soul, our consciousness, our world, all is generated by what's inside our skull. How could this be? If there were ways to know, Galileo should rise and inquire, and the man with the long eyebrows stood up to lead the way. Notes Galileo may be excused if he tends to reinterpret facts, events, and even poems in the light of his limited knowledge. That we are not at the center of the universe, we have become used to, perhaps consoling ourselves, that while our location may be peripheral, our mission is not. That we may descend from simpler forms of life, we have also had to accept. Perhaps we can be proud of how high we have risen from such a lowly start. But that our very soul may be not just mortal but mechanical, the mere whistle of the steely locomotive, as Thomas Huxley, Darwin's friend, once said, may be more difficult to swallow. Huxley, who was sure that evolution by natural selection could explain most things humans, was at a loss with consciousness and left the door open. How is it that anything so remarkable as a state of consciousness comes about as a result of irritating nervous system is just as unaccountable as the appearance of the gene when Aldin rubbed his lamp? Galileo's guide in the first part of the book is Francis Crick. After discovering DNA's double helix, Crick devoted his life, together with Christoph Koch, to the study of the brain basis of consciousness. Unlike Huxley, Crick left no door open for the soul, not even a window of opportunity. You, your joys and your sorrows are nothing but a pack of neurons, is from the astonishing hypothesis, The Scientific Search for the Soul, Scribner, 1999. Koch, on the other hand, may be less categorical. The picture of the hippocampal formation is courtesy of Kohibo Saki. Each yellow triangular shaped cell body is a single pyramidal neuron. Like a tree, each neuron sends down a long root axon by which it transmits signals to other neurons and sends up a thick set of branches, dendrites, where it receives connections, synapses from the axons of other neurons. The human brain has about 100 billion neurons and at least 1,000 times more synapses among them. Its many stars are not floating in the void. The poet quoted by Galileo is Lucretius, who in his De Rerum Natura, on the nature of things, attempted an exposition of science in poetry. This is a genre that has not had much success since.